Coming up, it's called America's Best Investment, and it's saving us billions. Plus, I walked into that jail feeling like discarded trash. A radio host discovers a light in the darkness. Plus, his business failed, and he thought his life did as well. I didn't understand what was happening. Hear how he picked himself up in a way he never expected. Wow, that was for me. On today's 700 Club. All right, awesome. Welcome, folks, after this Memorial Day holiday, I hope everybody's back and not too flooded out. It flooded like crazy here and every place else. Texas is having them. But anyhow, today we've got one of the most interesting guests that I've had in a long, long time. And the book is called Light in Our Darkness. But it's a story of absolute degradation and then redemption. And it, it, did, it, did you have a chance to read it? No, I didn't. Fascinating. I didn't. You had the book. <laughs> I had the book and I read it. And you it's very it on, interesting. <laughs> yeah. I mean, hey, uh, crack cocaine, addict, mm -hmm. prostitute, the whole smear and coming out the other side. It, well, that's it, what Jesus does. Right? Amen. Well, it's there. Well, homes and businesses as well as uh, uh, prison uh, uh, had to be uh, evacuated. And today, people in Texas are getting ready for even more rain. Charlene Aaron has that story. The floodwaters are still rising in the Lone Star State. We've never seen it this high. So, and of course, everybody thinks I'm crazy for not leaving. In Houston, this swollen river has overtaken several small communities, forcing many to flee their homes. I thought we were going to be safe. I didn't know it was going to come up this fast. In coastal Brazoria County, 2,600 inmates from two prisons were evacuated because of historic flooding. The heavy rains have been falling since Wednesday. At least six people have died in the flooding as record-breaking rains have swept away cars and damaged homes. Several people are missing. In Parker County, Texas, debris and rushing water hampered rescue efforts for a missing 10-year-old boy who fell into a river while fishing Sunday afternoon. It's frustrating that we have the family here and they need some closure and we haven't been able to give it to them yet. In Kansas, much of the central region has been under a flash flood watch through the end of last week. Oh God. This twister touched down in Colorado near the Nebraska border. And on the east coast from the Carolinas to New York, people are dealing with the aftermath of Tropical Storm Bonnie, which dumped eight inches of rain in South Carolina shutting down parts of busy I-95 on Memorial Day. Forecasters expect the severe weather to continue today for much of the central and northern plains from Kansas to North Dakota. Charlene Aaron, CBN News. Well, they talk about drought, but the drought is over. Well, in other news, this extremely unusual presidential election year could soon get even stronger. Pat, talk of another presidential candidate has picked up steam in the last couple days after conservative analyst Bill Kristol, the editor of the Weekly Standard, announced on Twitter that there will be an independent candidate, an impressive one, with a strong team and a real chance. Donald Trump fired back saying the Republican Party has to be smart and strong if it wants to win in November, and he said, quote, if dummy Bill Kristol actually does get a spoiler to run as an independent, say goodbye to the Supreme Court. Nobody knows who the third party candidate might be. Some conservatives have opposed Trump because they don't feel he truly believes in their ideas, while others say a third party candidate could split the Republican vote and lead to Hillary Clinton winning the election. Pat? Again, Bill Kristol, he's just his day in the sun. I think his daddy was the great writer and he's just kind of basking in his glory. But listen, it's too late to get candidates on the ballot in many, many, many states across the nation. So there wouldn't be a possibility, a snowball's chance in July of having some third party candidate win. It couldn't happen. So that in itself is, is a chimera. But the problem is that we're dealing with is that this would siphon off just enough votes in a very close election to make sure that uh, the Democrat won the election. Now, this fellow claims to be a conservative. What a joke, John. 
Pat, Hillary Clinton could face a challenge of a different kind in November's election, the rising premiums from Obamacare. The Hill website reports that those premiums are expected to jump more sharply this year than in previous years, and Republicans are using that as a campaign issue. Trump and Senate Republicans have agreed that Obamacare increases could help Republicans in the election. Clinton has acknowledged that Obamacare prices are going up, but she still defends the law and its benefits. The parents of a four-year-old boy who fell into a gorilla exhibit at the Cincinnati Zoo are thanking God for his safety. In a statement, they said, we're so thankful to the Lord that our child is safe, and they added he is home and doing just fine. You can see what happened here. The boy fell into the zoo's gorilla enclosure and came face to face with a 400-pound silverback. After 10 minutes, during which the animal dragged the boy through the water, zookeepers shot and killed the gorilla. Some witnesses said the 17-year-old gorilla was protecting the boy. Animal activists have protested the zoo's decision and held a vigil for the gorilla over the weekend. But the zoo is defending its call. That child's life was in danger. We stand by our decision and we make the same call today. Jack Hanna, the director emeritus of the Columbus, Ohio Zoo, says it was the right call. And Pat, he believes the gorilla would have killed the boy. Well, it was a tragedy, and I'm, I know there's a great sentiment for wildlife and the gorillas. Those uh, silver black gorillas are endangered. Uh, they, they were up in the Karunja National P Park in uh, Zaire, and uh, poachers are shooting them, and uh, uh, some people are eating their flesh, and others are, you know, selling off their parts. These are a beautiful species of creature and we want to protect them but at the same time if it looks like one of them is going to kill a little baby and the people say oh well he was really trying to defend the little child but I saw him pulling that kid back and forth through the water and it didn't look like it so Jack Hanna is an expert and if he says uh, okay they did the right thing then I would go along with his opinion. Well, there's another t tragedy in the news. A dear, dear friend of, of this ministry and of the nation uh, has passed away, and John has that story. That's right, Pat. Jan Crouch, the co-founder of the Trinity Broadcasting Network, has died. Doctors had been treating her at an Orlando area hospital after she suffered a stroke last Wednesday. Jan and her husband, Paul Crouch, partnered in the launch of TBN and its expansion around the world for over 40 years. Her family said in a statement, Jan Crouch loved many things, but most of all, she loved Jesus and now has seen him face to face and has experienced his grace and fullness. She has taken a piece of our hearts with her, but it's so wonderful to know that Paul and Jan Crouch are together again in the arms of Jesus. Jan Crouch was 78. Pat, some terribly sad news to report. Well, it is. She has had, uh, she had a stroke before and uh, was in failing health, and uh, I think this is just uh, uh, culmination of that illness. We're sorry to see it, but uh, you know the thing is, people die, and you know that's that's part. Of it. It's life, and then death, and that's the way we live. And none of us are going to live forever. So when let's we live in eternity with the Lord. Well, we'll be right back with more of the 700 Club. We've got some very interesting guests about what's going on in our world. So don't miss it. Well, the United States' most reliable ally in the world is the state of Israel, and the U.S. sends more foreign aid to Israel than any other nation. Critics are saying, well, that's too much. Uh, but it turns out the U.S. gets a significant return on its investment. Chris Mitchell is bringing that story from Jerusalem. The U.S. currently sends about $3 billion each year to Israel. Some may argue Israel doesn't deserve those billions, but others contend it's America's best investment in foreign aid. One benefit, more U.S. jobs. By law, most of the military aid sent to Israel must be spent back in the U.S. with American defense contractors. That translates to tens of thousands of jobs. What's more, when Israel buys weapons like U.S. sophisticated fighter jets, they make their own improvements. For example, the General Dynamics plant manager asserts that Israeli improvements save the manufacturer 10 to 20 years of research and development. 
He estimated that led to more than 700 modifications to the current F-16, valued at a mega billion dollar bonanza to the manufacturer. Another benefit, intelligence. General George Keegan, the former chief of U.S. Air Force Intelligence, said Israel provided intelligence on the Air Force capabilities, new weapons, electronics, and jamming devices of mutual U.S.-Israel adversaries. He stated, I could not have procured the intelligence with five CIAs. Israel also provides U.S. Special Operation teams with invaluable experience and training before they head to war zones in the Middle East. And perhaps the biggest U.S. benefit is strengthening its number one Middle East ally at a time when both are on the front lines of the war against Islamic terror. Chris Mitchell, CBN News, Jerusalem. Well, joining us to talk about U.S.-Israel relations is Ambassador Yoram Ettinger. He's an advisor to the Israeli Knesset, a former liaison to the United States Congress, and it's a pleasure to welcome to the 700 Club, Ambassador Ettinger. Well, Thank you. Welcome. Thank nice you. to have you. Thank you. Let me ask you about the Palestinians. Is Mahmoud Abbas a appropriate partner for peace, and is he really trying to get peace together? <laughs> During my, my days in this country, especially in the state of Texas, mm -hmm. I was told that we should be wary of deadly coral snake posing as harmless skipjack snake. <laughs> Those are two snakes with the same yeah. colors, but in reverse. Right. Mahmoud Abbas is that deadly coral snake posing as harmless skipjack snake, and the most authentic reflection of what is the Palestinian Authority and who is Mahmoud Abbas is not the talk at international uh, podiums, but rather the daily education which mm -hmm. he uh, has introduced into the Palestinian Authority, K through 12. This is the most ferocious hate education, anti-Semitic, anti-Jewish, anti-USA, anti-democratic, uh, and therefore, uh, Mahmoud Abbas has not been an asset to the peaceful coexisting attempt, but rather a very d egregious uh, liability. Why do you think these uh, academics in America get so glassy-eyed and they talk about uh, the persecution of the Palestinians and we're going to boycott and divest the Israeli investments? What, what do you think? What's wrong with them? Well, those are the same academicians who uh, provide a tailwind to the old man from Iran who was on exile in Paris, the Ayatollah Khomeini. Yeah. And they stabbed the back of the Shah of Iran and produced uh, the most anti-American regime mm. anywhere in the world, the regime of the Ayatollahs. Those are the same academics who were behind Saddam Hussein of Iraq until the day he invaded Kuwait back in 1990. Mm -hmm. uh, those are the same academics who welcomed the Arab tsunami of 2011 yeah. uh, as if it was, as, as if it is an Arab spring. Uh, those are the same academics, uh, by the way, just like the Department of State, who referred to that Arab tsunami as a transition towards uh, democracy. So why should anybody be surprised that those are the same people who refer to the Palestinian coral snake as if it is a <laughs> skipjack snake. I notice that the court in Egypt has uh, um, sentenced the uh, head of the Muslim Brotherhood, I think, into, into life in prison because of uh, murders he committed. W what do you think about, uh, we, we were welcoming the Muslim Brotherhood as a partner in peace. Absolutely, the president of this uh, country uh, came to Egypt before the toppling of uh, President uh, Mubarak, and he, in fact, insisted that the Muslim Brotherhood leadership will attend uh, his uh, lecture at the Cairo University at a time when the Muslim Brotherhood was rightly uh, defined as a terror organization by the Egyptian authorities. That visit was similar to Jimmy Carter's visit to Tehran. Jimmy Carter stabbed the back of the pro-American Shah. 
President Obama stabbed the back of pro-American Mubarak, and both gave rise to most vicious anti-American uh, regimes. Today, we have another potentially pro-American regime of General Sisi, yes. but the president of the U.S., the Department of State in the U.S., still are turning a cold shoulder towards President uh, Sisi uh, and uh, pressuring him to alleviate the pressure of the mm. Muslim Brotherhood. By the way, the leader of Turkey, a very anti-American Erdogan, is one of the main Muslim Brotherhood personalities in the Middle East. Well, of course, uh, they, they set up the uh, Palestinian Liberation Organization. That was an offspring, and Hamas. They were offsprings of the Brotherhood, weren't they? Absolutely. Not only that, but at the time of the PLO, that was the chief ally of the Soviet uh, Union, chief ally of the ruthless communist regimes in East Europe, and a major source platform of international terrorism, which today has uh, erupted as a wave of anti-American Islamic terrorism. The mm. roots uh, were planted during the days of the PLO, and, uh, and Mahmoud Abbas is the leader of the PLO. What do you think is going on with our State Department? What, what's happening? Of course, the president is, is leading the charge to embrace Iran and uh, his aide, uh, uh, was saying, well, what we want to do is turn away from uh, Egypt and Jordan and Israel and Turkey and embrace Iran as our principal partner in the Middle East. Well, what, is, what is causing that thinking, do you believe? Well, I, I think it's a traditional uh, third world driven uh, train of thought, which has dominated the Department of State, a multilateralism over the independence of American uh, uh, political and military uh, action, uh, primacy to uh, third world uh, powers, even if they are anti-American, but maybe most importantly, the victory of wishful thinking over uh, realism, mm -hmm. uh, the victory of engagement with rogue regimes over the confrontation and the, and the defiance of rogue regime. And by the way, uh, the Department of State was a chief opponent uh, of the establishment of a Jewish state in 1948. They pressured President Truman severely to oppose the establishment of the State of Israel. They succeeded in, in convincing him to impose a military embargo on the Middle East at a time when the British supplied mm -hmm. the Arabs with, uh, with arms. Yeah. And at the end of the war, when the military establishment in America, then General Omar Bradley, the chairman of the Joint Chief of Staff, mm -hmm. assessed the Jewish state to be a formidable potential for American presence in the Middle East. And he recommended to declare Israel a, a, a main ally of America. It was the Department of State that overruled uh, General Bradley claiming okay. that Israel is a very short-lived experience. Israel <laughs> would not be a military power. And they even forewarned that Israel would become a chief ally of communism against the U.S. And how wrong have yeah. they been? Well, speaking about communists, uh, it looks like Putin has succeeded. Uh, the uh, Russians were driven out of Egypt and out of the Middle East, and now they're back in Syria. and and uh, apparently building a presence in that area that's maybe threatening Israel. What, what do you think about, uh, what should we do about that? Well, the, the rise of the Soviet Union is a direct result of the unfortunate erosion of the U.S. posture of deterrence, the contraction of the U.S. military uh, footprint, uh, and the lower uh, the more eroded the U.S. posture of deterrence, the higher mm -hmm. is the Russian profile in the area. President Sisi of Egypt is a very classic example. He wants to be a pro-American uh, leader yes. in the Middle yeah. East, but the U.S. has distanced itself, not the U.S., the it's American stupid. president, yeah. has distanced himself from uh, General uh, Sisi. By the way, that reality, strangely enough, has brought Israel closer to Saudi Arabia, closer to Bahrain and Abu Dhabi and Jordan and Egypt, because the less they rely on the U.S., the more they think 
they yeah. must rely on Israel because in their assessment, Israel today is the most reliable life insurance agent <laughs> in the Middle East. When it's all said and done and you're looking at the world and you, you see it from the clear perspective you've got, what is your uh, feeling about the future? Well, how do you assess what's going to happen? Well, uh, I think most of uh, the future depends on the U.S. I firmly believe, as a person who has known the U.S. since 1966, when I first came for my undergraduate uh, in this country, I firmly believe that the U.S. still have the critical mass of uh, reality-driven uh, people, high-quality people in the military, in the policy-making, in the high-tech uh, agricultural uh, sectors to bring about a rebounded U.S. to where it should be, namely the effective leader of the free world, not a follower of the free world, not a co-equal, but a leader. Mm. For me, as an Israeli, the stronger the U.S., the more secure I uh, feel. Mm. And it seems to me that uh, most of us, or all of us in the free world should pray that following November, once again, we'll see a U.S. with resurrected uh, realistic uh, defense budget, mm -hmm. with resurrected U.S. posture of deterrence in the world, because global sanity depends on the willingness of the U.S. to defy odds rather than uh, be defied by the odds. Ambassador, I commend you for your bold statement. Appreciate that. And uh, I guess you'd be on the Trump team <laughs> the way things are going. But we're, we're not endorsing any candidate right now. But I think we're talking about restoring the greatness of America. Ambassador, thank you very much. And thank you for your faith-driven leadership. Thank God you very bless much. you. Thank you. Well, Ambassador Edinger is the author of the Edinger Report, an online newsletter. You can find out how to subscribe by going to our website, cbnnews.com. Um, Terry, what's next? Well, coming up, an entrepreneur loses his business and has to move back home with his parents. I fell into a depression, and then I started to panic, and then I started to feel so afraid of everything that I just kind of stayed in my room. See how this man is set free from paralyzing fear in an instant. Well, you're watching The 700 Club. We're delighted to have all of you with us. We've got a tremendous guest coming up in just a few minutes, and you don't want to miss one word of it. But right now, Phil Woodbury, when Phil lost his job, he also lost a major part of his identity. This highly skilled CPA was out of steady work for two and a half years. But today, what seemed like one of the worst things to happen has become one of the best. My confidence had always been in my resume. As a CPA, Phil Woodbury relied solely on his resume and professional skills for job opportunities and a way to provide for his family. But in 2006, a shakeup at the office left Phil unemployed. He told his wife, Deb, and though their budget was already tight, they were confident he would find a new job soon. But Phil had no success. I'm a CPA. Uh, I have a Master's of Business Administration. I'm very well-educated, very highly experienced in what I do, but that got me nowhere. Deb had always tithed from her income and continued to do so, but Phil was reluctant about giving. I didn't really give. I didn't really have a generous spirit. If you're a giver, and you, you give generously, it always is gonna come back to you. So you reap what you sow. When he wasn't applying for jobs, Phil studied God's Word and finally understood what it meant to give from the heart. One of the things that I studied during that time period was Deuteronomy chapter 8. And, and one of the verses in there says that it's God who gives me the ability to get wealth. And I realized that these, these things that I had, this education I had, these skills I had, were, were things that God had given me, that God had provided. He had, had brought me along this path but I'd kind of gotten off the path, and I needed to get back on the path. 
He came into agreement with his wife about giving and started with a small amount from his severance pay. Then he found a temporary job. From those earnings, he gave more. That generous spirit that I did not have was growing and developing. Phil was out of full-time work for two and a half years. However, the couple remained faithful in giving. As they put their trust in God, all their needs were met. Each month, they were able to pay every bill on time. People just giving us money. Um, he had extra jobs. I mean, it, it was just amazing, you know, how God took care of us. They came from God. They'd come from me. And if I knew where it all came from, then, then I could say, oh, I did this, I did that. But I can't. During this time, they even paid off Phil's truck. Instead of pocketing what used to be their $250 payment each month, they added the full amount to their monthly giving. That was the moment that giving became a part of me. I really could have said, this is mine. And I said, no, this is going to God. His part-time position became full-time work. He came out of unemployment with better finances and a stronger relationship with God. Today, Phil and Deb give beyond their tithe and partner with CBN. The Woodberries believe giving faithfully and obediently starts with a heart for God. He is amazing. It was His plan to change me, to move my confidence from me to Him, to move my trust from me to Him, and to finally give it all to Him. Well, I will tell you how much I appreciate the people who have made pledges during the last week when we were doing a brief telethon, and uh, we are very grateful for you and what you've done. And right now, we have something we want to give to those who are uh, becoming 700 Club members. It's called Victory Through Life's Storms. And this is a brand new uh, DVD that is available, and you are participating. What do you think? You know, it's wonderful. Not only do you share from yeah. years of experience where things have been difficult and you've stayed the course, oh, yeah. but also a number of other people on there who are in life crises and have really just trusted God and seen victory on the other side. So it's very encouraging. I think anybody who watches that is going to be encouraged in the midst of their own challenges. Well, there are people who have storms in life, and they come well, upon all really. of us, and <laughs> this is a, you know, a, well, it's what the Bible says. It's also personal testimonies, and it's a deep teaching on what mm -hmm. the Lord has to say about crisis and what you do when you encounter it. Okay, what do you got next? Well, you're about to meet a man who's personally experienced victory through one of life's storms. When George McReynolds' business tanked, he was forced to move back in with his parents. Soon a paralyzing fear set in, and George became a prisoner in his own room. That's good. Hold on, let me straighten it out. I had a lot of business. I was busy almost every weekend, sending about three or four booze out a weekend, maybe a couple during the week. Three, and then we'll put the yeah. logo of the wedding on here. Okay? Fantastic. Yeah. George McReynolds' business, running out mobile photo booths, had been thriving and growing for years. But as other competitors entered the market, his client base dropped off dramatically. We were one of the first ones to start it, you know, in the area. But now everybody had a photo booth, and people weren't paying as much money for them. Eventually, George couldn't afford to live on his own and had to move back in with his parents. It was actually devastating because I didn't know what I would do next because I had always been on my own. How was I going to pay my bills and survive? I tried to look for other jobs and work freelance for other people doing video work. Nothing stuck. I felt directionless. I fell into a depression because of the finances, and I felt like a kind of a failure. I didn't want to go out of the house. I lost my motivation to work, even socialize. George also began to question God. I lost my faith at this point. I saw things going so bad, I didn't understand what was happening. Am I going to be financially okay, mentally okay, or is this it? Is this it? You know, is this my life? Meanwhile, he kept feeling worse. It got bad. My depression and anxiety got really bad. And then I started to panic. And then I started to feel so afraid of everything that I just kind of stayed in my room. 
One day, he turned on the television. It was just on. I just turned the TV on. It was on the 700 Club, and Pat was praying. Somebody, I believe the name's George, you are so terrified. You are just having terror. You don't quite know what you're afraid of, but you are afraid of everything. And God is setting you free. Perfect love casts out fear, for fear has torment. You are free in the name of Jesus. The spirit of fear is leaving you now in Jesus' name. It was specific, and I felt like it was just perfect timing. I turned on the TV, there he is. And the next moment after he prayed, I got up, and I felt clear. I felt like, good. And I just went out. <laughs> that was it. I really just went out, and I was like, Wow, was, that was for me. After the next couple of days, I started to feel good about my life again. I still had the same problems, and I still had the same circumstance that, that I was in, but I knew that God was with me from that moment. One, two, three. <laughs> you crazy kid. With his faith in God restored, George overcame his fears and got back to work. This time, he decided to trust God with his business and it's been growing steadily ever since. The phone's ringing off the hook, you know, because God's in control of it. I'm not in control, I'm trying to fix it, you know. He, I let him have it. I learned most that Jesus knows me and knows exactly what's happening in my life. He knows what he's doing, and it's all about trust, you know, just trusting him that he has a plan for your life. He does have a plan for my life, for your life, for all of us. Sometimes he needs to get our attention to get us back on track. I think that's what happened to George. God is real. He hears your need. He hears your voice. He knows what you're going through. And we want to pray for you today. We have some prayer reports of others. Yeah, go ahead, please. Pat, for more than 10 years, Linda, who lives in Sebring, Florida, had chronic trouble with her lower back and hip. She took strong prescription medications to fight the pain. Nothing seemed to work. One day she's watching this program and she heard Wendy giving a word of knowledge about someone with nerve damage. And then you immediately gave another word. In the small of your back, God has just healed you in the name of Jesus. Linda claimed the words for herself. The pain went away immediately. Two days later, she kept an appointment with her orthopedic surgeon. After his exam, he told her he could find nothing wrong with her. Completely well, healed. Here's somebody named Danuta from uh, Mansfield, Massachusetts. She was in constant discomfort for several months due to pain in her leg and knee. She believed Jesus could heal her, but uh, she wouldn't get anything. And then she was watching this show, and uh, we were praying, and she was sarcastic. She yelled out and said, well, one more prayer. And the next moment, Terry said, someone else, you have a problem with your calf or your left leg. It has something to do with the bone uh, deterioration, and God's healing you. And guess what? Danuta got healed. And even when you're sarcastic, God will still heal you. Okay. Sometimes, especially when you're sarcastic. Especially when you're sarcastic. <laughs> okay. Well, Terry and I are going to join together right now. We're going to believe God. Father, we pray now for people. We thank you for answers to prayer. And we ask now for these who have, we in our audience who are suffering, who need financial help, who are looking for guidance, who have been beset by demonic power, whatever it is, in the name of Jesus, receive an answer to your prayer. And may the Lord himself appear to you and touch you. Terry. You know, this sounds kind of crazy, but there's someone, you have uncontrollable hiccups. And that might sound like it's a light issue, but it really hurts your chest and your heart. God is stopping that for you right now. Just lift up your hands and receive it. Somebody's got a growth in your throat. It, 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 it could be infected tonsils, but it's swelled up so bad that you can hardly swallow. Right now, put your hand on your throat in the name of Jesus. Be healed. Someone with scoliosis. Thank you, Lord. Bad scoliosis. Thank God you, is literally straightening your spine right Thank now. Thank you, Lord. Just stretch, stretch. Do what you couldn't do before. With God, all things are possible. With God, all things are possible. With God, all things are possible. Mm -hmm. Receive an answer in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Terry. Yeah. Well, still ahead, you're going to meet a radio show host and an author who was once a crack-addicted prostitute and a prisoner. I walked into that jail feeling like discarded trash, but I walked out feeling like possibly I could change my life. 
She did. Lisa Kratz Thomas shares her overcomer story. You don't want to miss it. It's ahead on today's 700 Club. Welcome back to the 700 Club. Members of Congress say the Obama administration isn't doing enough to stop ISIS persecution and killing of Christians in the Middle East. Our president has not come to the standard that I believe is adequate to, to deal with this, uh, with this horrible situation and the challenge that we face in the Middle East. We have innocent people by the hundreds of thousands, if not by the millions, who are in jeopardy of being slaughtered in the same way the Jews were slaughtered during the Holocaust. Members of the House Foreign Affairs Committee are recommending steps the administration can take to protect vulnerable people in Iraq and Syria. The president of Egypt is promising to bring to justice members of a Muslim mob who stripped an elderly Christian woman naked, then paraded her through the streets of a village. The attack came after a rumor that the woman's son had an affair with a Muslim woman. An armed mob of Muslims then attacked the 70-year-old woman and they looted and torched seven Christian homes. The president of Egypt said on live TV that such attacks divide Egyptians, and he said the law must take its course. Well, you can always get the latest from CBN News by going to our website at cbnnews.com. Pat and Terry will be back with more of the 700 Club right after this. On-demand videos, go to cbn.com. In the late 1970s, Lisa Kratz Thomas was a young professional living in Washington, D.C. She eagerly embraced the liberated lifestyle. And it's laid out in this book, Light in Our Darkness, of how she went absolutely into degradation. Well, she's here with us right now, but first, let's look at this. Lisa Kratz Thomas spent her younger years fighting a drug addiction. She turned to prostitution to support her addiction and spent time behind bars. I walked into that jail feeling like discarded trash, but I walked out feeling like possibly I could change my life. Today, Lisa helps formerly incarcerated women who are trying to reclaim their lives. In her new book, Light in Our Darkness, she shares how she finally found freedom both from jail and the destructive lifestyle that kept her in prison for years. Well, welcome to the 700 Club, Lisa Kratz Thomas. Lisa, it's good to have you with us. I am so happy to be here, Pat. You, you don't even know. I'm just so <laughs> ecstatic. Well, you know, I read your book, and I see you sitting here, and I cannot believe that the woman who's sitting here is the one who was portrayed in that book. It's an incredible transformation. Yeah, Jesus can really clean you up good. You know, it's... Yeah. Um, could never imagine 25 years ago when I was living on the streets of D.C., when I was sleeping in Lafayette Park, yeah. when I was addicted to cocaine, that I would end up on the 700 Club yeah. with Pat Robertson. Lisa, what were you trained as? You were a, quote, young professional. What, what were you trained to do? Well, I graduated from an all-girls Catholic high school and got a job with the Department of Justice. Yeah. How ironic is that? Um, as a secretary. So I had a, a great secretarial career. Well, I read your book. You know, I, I'm familiar with the scene in Washington, as, mm -hmm. as some of us have before we came to the Lord. Uh, but you, your book was as if every time you had a date and wanted for dinner, you were supposed to have sex with a guy. I mean, was it, was it that way? I mean, you were liberated because of the pill. Exactly. Well, my philosophy was I would have sex with you first and then decide if I was going to date you. Seriously, that oh, is. Come on. Are you no. serious? Oh, yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. That's that's how I was living my life. Um, I bought into every single lie that was peddled by the uh, women's movement at that time. Mm -hmm. Well, the whole idea is that you will now be liberated. You got this pill. You can you're not going to get pregnant. And you can just live it up and, and, and engage in any kind of kinky activity. Mm -hmm. Did you go for all this kink and that kind of stuff? You know what? I did whatever I had to do to escape 
the walls that I had built in my own mind, Pat. Yeah. There was so much pain. There was, I, I felt so bad about myself that whatever I thought would allow me that escape, mm -hmm. I would take advantage of it and I would try it. Well, somewhere along the way, um, you had multiple sex partners, and uh, then you got with a guy who became your pimp. Was he selling you drugs? He got you hooked on crack? Well, you know, it, 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 it never is that clean cut. Yeah. You know, we were, we dated and, and for a long time, and then we both got addicted to crack. And when you get to a point where you can't go to work, you can't make money any other way, you do whatever you have to do. And so he was my boyfriend turned pimp later in our relationship, yeah. So you, you would go out and have two or three tricks a night in order mm -hmm. to get the money to pay for the crack. Is that That's right. Lisa, what does it feel like? I mean, you're, you're in a Catholic high school. <laughs> you, you're, you're a nice young girl. You've got a nice job with the Justice Department mm -hmm. of all places. And uh, yet you're out selling yourself. What does it feel like? You've got some stranger coming in and you're going to give mm -hmm. your body to him. How, how does that feel? I mean, I, I can't conceive of it. Well, you know, it, it starts in your mind. It's, yeah. it's. Um, I can look back to when I was five years old. Satan started to weave this web in me that you're no good. You're a bad little girl, mm. uh, and the world would be better off if you weren't here. And when you get those thoughts into your mind, and there's nothing to dispel those, that becomes part of who you are, the fabric of who you are. Uh -huh. So, I, I didn't think of it that way. I just felt like this is my life, and this is what what a person like me does. And it, it evolved into not being able to get up and go to work and take a shower because the drugs took over. Mm -hmm. And so, um, you know, it, it's, it's one of those things where you shut part of yourself down to be able to do what you have to do. Mm -hmm. But, you know, there's always times in the day that you can't shut that down. When the drugs are gone, when the people are gone, when the light of day comes up yeah. and you're faced with the reality of what you've done and what your life is, the shame and the guilt and the pain is so overwhelming. That's when you start moving into those suicidal thoughts to say, hey, I'd be better off if I wasn't here. Well, along the way, you got pregnant. Several times you got pregnant. You, you had abortion. What did you think about abortion? We, your book has some word about Dr. Nathanson and what he did, but uh, uh, will you fed the life? It's, it's my body and I can do what I want to with it. Well, absolutely. And, and that's exactly what it was, a lie that was fabricated by a bunch of men sitting around the table and said, hey, let's push this concept. It's a woman's right to choose. That's mm -hmm. what NARAL did. And I bought that lie because I was under the assumption that it was a mass of cells, that it wasn't a human being, that it was just something that you could go in and get rid of. And it was, the, the, you know, it's so amazing because all the things that I'd been through in my life, God healed me. I started walking in sobriety. I started walking with the Lord. But that one part of me, Pat, mm -hmm. those abortions kept me in such bondage to shame for such a long time because, mm -hmm. you know, you only know what you know at the time. Yeah. But when you find out what you've done, oh, it just, you know, I just, I, I can remember just crying out to the Lord and saying, Lord, you've healed me from everything. Mm -hmm. Please, Lord, take this. I'm so sorry for what I've done. It kept me locked into that shame. And, you know, if there's anybody that's listening, I just have to say, Jesus can heal you everywhere you hurt. Yeah. And I am yeah. living proof <laughs> of that. Well, did you, did that bring you out of the lifestyle? I mean, you wound up in prison because it was possession or, or, or selling or, or... Writing bad checks to support my oh, habit. You're right, oh, right. Oh, yeah. You got your bad checks. Oh, yeah. So there wasn't any crime that you weren't capable of committing. Oh, no. I was, I was very crafty. I, I could do whatever I had to do. I was a professional liar. Um, I could make you believe anything that I needed you to believe so I could get high. Well, you were actually a slave to this stuff, weren't you? Absolutely. I mean, you had that was more important than anything in life, was getting a, a, another fix. That's it. It was that way. It was that way. Oh. And nothing, I, not my family, not my health, not my safety. 
I mean, I've had guns drawn on me. I've had, I've been in, in, you know, uh, situations with gangs. Nothing mattered to me except getting the drug because it's a vicious cycle. You start, you escape, then the reality comes back. And the only way that you can make that go away is to do the, the very We're thing that got you there. Beaten in those situations. Oh yeah. Many yeah. times. Many times. Um, my, my boyfriend, my pimp, uh, broken nose, broken arms, broken ribs, um, thrown down steps, thrown out of cars. Um, and I was just like, hey, uh, that's okay. If this is the price I have to pay, then it's just the price I have to pay. Unbelievable. Now, this started when you were five years old. I mean, this self-image thing. Yes, it did. And you just felt you were worthless. I did. I really felt like God made good people and bad people. Yeah. And I just happened to be one of the bad people. And that he kind of liked me, but he wasn't really there for me. <laughs> yeah. I mean, really. Yeah, it's terrible. All right, you wound up. How did you finally make the decision to get out of this bondage? Because this, this pip has you in bondage. You, you kept going back to him, even though he beat you up and, mm -hmm. he, and stole your money and everything else. Mm -hmm. Well, <clears throat> what really helped me was incarceration, believe yeah. it or not, because it took me off the streets and it gave me enough time to have clarity in my mm -hmm. spirit and in my mind. And um, when I got out, I, you would think when I walked out of the jail that I would have walked into recovery or the church or something, mm -hmm. but I didn't. I went back with, with him and we ended up in the crack house and probably two hours after I was released from incarceration. And about five minutes after that, I was getting my head beat in. And I left, I walked out and I went and I sat on the curb. I, I'm telling you, this is like yesterday. Mm -hmm. And I looked up and I said, if you're up there, you either change me or you take me because I cannot live like this anymore. Yeah. What was wrong with this guy? How come he wanted to beat you up? What was, what was, was he psychotic or what was wrong with him? Well, that? you know, drugs and crack cocaine, that does some weird things to your thinking and it brings on a, a, a paranoia and it was severe in him. Mm -hmm. And he always thought that there were really people chasing us, people in the house, and that I was part of the, that conspiracy. Oh, man. So, um, and I knew every time we'd get high, he'd do it. But trust me, it didn't stop me. How often were you in the hospital? Uh, a few times, but I, I didn't have the money, uh, the resources, uh, and I certainly didn't want, I was afraid of authority in any way, shape, or form, so I kind of mm -hmm. stayed away from that. Well, you made that decision, I'm coming out of here. He was beating your head against the wall, mm -hmm. and you said, I'm not going to take this anymore, and you cried out to God. What happened? Well, I wish I could say everything went well from then, but it didn't. Yeah. But shortly after that, I got involved in 12-step, and I was introduced to uh, the concept of a God that was loving. Mm -hmm. And I was given a set of tapes by a popular TV evangelist, Grace, Grace, and More Grace. Mm -hmm. And I popped those tapes in, and I heard that the Lord loves you, Lisa. Mm -hmm. He loves you. And he would have died if you were the only person on the face of this earth. Mm -hmm. And you knew the Holy Spirit was there because I'd heard that many times. I mean, there were people always coming to the rehabs and the jail telling me yeah. God loved me. And I was like, well, he may love you, honey, but he doesn't love me, okay? <laughs> yeah. And so, but I heard it that day. And there was this sense of relief. Mm -hmm. There was this sense that, oh my gosh, it's you know, maybe he really does love me. Yeah. And that was it. And that was it. What, how simplistic for such a complex situation. Isn't that amazing? <laughs> well, you went from there. I mean, you're out teaching and preaching and leading <laughs> other people to the Lord. It's just an amazing transformation. How long did it take to get you cleaned up? And, and It didn't take long. I really? mean, really. You know, I, I started mentoring women inside the rooms of 12-step probably a, a, a year after I was sober and um, then really got connected with my church and started a women's ministry. And, um, you know, I've always loved to do things big. I always yeah. like to do things that are exciting. And so um, God put that in me. Mm -hmm. I, I used that for the wrong things. My motives were wrong. But when I aligned back with his will, mm -hmm. things started to happen in a huge way. The thing about that's so interesting is there's no shame. I mean, the, the Lord has taken that shame away, and, 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 and you're clean, and you're a whole new, new creature. That's what, that's what the Bible says, isn't it? He does. I mean, 2 Corinthians 5, 17. When you're, creation, him, a, when you're in Him, when you're in Him. You're a new creation. I'm new. I'm new. I'm not ashamed of that. I'm not embarrassed by that. Because the Lord 
took me from the pits of hell mm -hmm. and, and, and took me really to the throne room. And why I need to share that with other people. He didn't do that. We're only as sick as our secrets. Yeah. So we've got to be able to share those things to help other people Listen, to walk with him. You're tremendous. Ladies and gentlemen, that's all the time we've got. But do you want to read this book? It's fantastic. Light in our darkness. And there are three people involved in this book, not just Lisa, but a couple of others. You want to read it. And it's available wherever books are sold. So it's all the time we've got. Lisa, you're terrific. God bless Thank you, darling. Thank you, Pat. God bless you. All right, we'll leave you with today's Power Minute. Love your enemies. Do good to those that are uh, hoping for nothing in return, and your reward will be great.